Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight, both virtually and in person. My name is Cassidy Segura Klaus, and I'm a graduating third year student here at McKinney and a founding member of the school's revived American Constitution Society chapter. Let me begin with a commendation to you all. I am so pleased with this turnout. We have nearly 500 people with us tonight, and that's excluding the Facebook live streams. That's 500 people who are not only interested, but engaged in their communities, who want to hear varying perspectives and be part of productive conversations. And make no mistake, you will hear varying perspectives tonight. Regardless of your viewpoint coming into the event, I'm confident that you will hear things that you do not like, things that you disagree with, things you've never considered before, and things that make you uncomfortable. That's good. Discomfort is the precursor to deeper understanding and expanded worldviews. Discomfort often comes alongside critical thought. And remember that critical merely means evaluative, not necessarily negative. How we deal with discomfort is an individual initiative. Do we turn back to the familiar or do we embrace the opportunity to learn? Do we exit our echo chambers ready to stand on our beliefs and listen to alternatives? Or do we refuse to engage at all? The ability to have vigorous, good faith debates undergirds a healthy democracy. The schedule for tonight is about an hour of statements from our speakers and the remaining time will be used to answer audience questions. With an audience this large, there is absolutely no way we will get to everyone's questions. But our goal is to respond to as many as possible and advance the conversation. It's possible that wordy questions, multi-part questions, and questions that begin with commentary will be rephrased for clarity. So as they stay in the State House, please use plain English and limit questions to a single subject. Otherwise, we will refrain from any editorializing. A series of thanks, thank yous are in order before we begin. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Gary Holland with the Indianapolis NAACP, who was the real mover and shaker behind this event and who engaged all of these powerful speakers. I'd like to thank the IU McKinney staff members who matched our enthusiasm for the event and who are incredibly helpful coordinating between all involved offices. A thank you also goes out to my fellow American Constitution Society and Black Law Students Association board members who, for their help managing all their logistics tonight. They also graciously gave up their seats here in the courtroom to make room for other community members to view this event live. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for agreeing to spend time with us tonight having this much needed conversation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Barbara Bowling, the president of the Indiana State NAACP and our moderator for the night. Thank you so much, Essie, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to um, our panelists for being here. I'm Barbara Bowling Williams, Indiana State Conference President and a member of the National Board of Directors of the NAACP. On behalf of the state conference that consists of 22 branches, six college chapters and eight youth council, I too welcome you to this important conversation that is intended to hear the views of our legislators, academics and community. I guess I represent the community. The law school is the appropriate setting for this discourse. Black History Month provides the perfect frame and backdrop, and it is fitting that the NAACP, a trusted voice in the community, join in partnership with the American Constitution Society and Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis Black Law Students Association to let all hear the truth, know the truth, and act upon the truth, for only then can we begin to speak truth to power? Let us begin by setting a framework and a foundation. We offer these baseline statements for your consideration. Disparities exist between the races in whatever matrix you choose to consider, health, education, socioeconomics, and et cetera. In an effort to identify, close, or solve the reasons behind the gaps, critical race theory attempts to determine the cause of the problem as a mean to eliminate the disparities rather than continue to address the symptoms. And so we offer this definition as for critical race theory, a framework 
that helps us understand how race and racism continue to shape the meaning of racial inequality in our dominant culture, our concepts of equality and equal laws and institutions, governmental and private practices, because these situations, our society continues to generate racial disparities viable in significant socioeconomic statistics that are traceable to America's past of racial subdivision and subordination despite civil rights reform in the 50s and 60s. CRT is motivated by a desire to attenuate this continuous cycle. Anti-CRT advocates center white children as without considering black children. CRT is not being taught in any 12 through K school in the state of Indiana. The average person has not heard the term CRT or what those letters stand for. A statement issued earlier by the governor's um, Holcomb's Chief Equity Inclusion and Equity Opportunity Office states that, in fact, CRT is not designed for elementary, middle, or high school students. It is a method of examination taught in some law schools and colleges used to analyze the role of race and racism in society. Ensuring our students have an inclusive and factual view of our nation's historic events, shortcomings, and progress is not critical race theory. It is a comprehensive and balanced education. <clears throat> Ensuring our teachers are culturally competent and able to engage with all children in our education system is not, criminal, is not critical race theory. It is equity in action. And so, I will read, to, as we begin, I will read a short bio of each speaker and um, announce the allocation of time that they will have for their presentation. And so without further, oh, one last thing, I wanted to um, advise you that we had invited Senator Scott Baldwin and had advertised that he was going to be here. However, um, at the last minute, he indicated that he would not be here without giving any explanation. So. Our first speaker, Indianapolis attorney Greg Taylor, became a member of the Indiana Senate Democrat Caucus after being elected to represent Senate District 33 in November of 2008. As a business and government attorney, Taylor joined the Senate with the breadth of knowledge and experience regarding economic development and job creation. In November of 2020, Senator Taylor was elected Indiana State Senator Minority Leader. Taylor also serves on law, criminal justice, and public safety committees of the National Conference of State Legislators, a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and staffs of the nation's 50 states, its commonwealth and territories. In addition, Senator Taylor has been appointed to the National Legislative Council Conference of the Council of State Governments, Economic Development Committee, as well as the Midwestern Legislative Conference Economic Development Committee. Senator Taylor, we welcome you to the podium and we have, you have five minutes. Thank you, Ms. Bowling. Um, I won't even need five minutes, but um, first thing I would like to say, just to provide some clarity, my colleague Scott Baldwin serves on the education committee for in the Senate, and he, uh, from what I understand, he is currently still in that education committee that is still going on at the Indiana State House, so he is not going to be able to be with us this evening. Uh, first of all, I want to take thank the NAACP, uh, Barbara Bowling, um, and other uh, members of the NAACP for always being a, an influencer in my life, even as a young child. I want to thank the IU McKinney School of Law for allowing us to have this very special discussion and learning experience about critical race theory. I'd like to thank the Black St Law Student Association, of which I was a member when I was at uh, the Maurer School of Law in Bloomington. I know how important it is to have those organizations available to provide a place for 
students of color that attend uh, very uh, th that attend the law schools here in the state of Indiana to have a place that they can go and communicate with their colleagues. I'd like to thank the American Constitutional Society for putting this together and coordinate with the Black Law Student Association uh, for providing us with this, uh, this framework in which to have this discussion. Um, when, when I contacted uh, Gary Holland to talk about what I wanted to do today, I, I wanted to focus on some factors that uh, I believe that all of us find ourselves in. And that is that there are times when we find ourselves in uncomfortable situations, uh, some of us more than others. Um, but I found myself in a very uncomfortable situation where friends and colleagues of mine were being criticized for their understanding of critical race theory. Fortunately for me, as a law student at uh, Indiana University Bloomington, I had the uh, opportunity to take a, that's the very class from Professor Kevin Brown, who's gonna speak with you today. And during that class, it was very apparent to me that this discussion was gonna become important in my life in the future. At 22 years old, I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no comprehension. So I'm confident that no child K through 12 will understand this. With that, I want to bring some clarity to this discussion of critical race theory that we've seen come up over and over again in the state of Indiana. And that was the purpose for me asking Gary to coordinate putting this discussion together. Um, so I'm gonna sit down and uh, I'd like to, uh, I don't know if you wanna do a file for, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator Taylor. Hey, Representative Bob Bainey has served in the Indiana House of Representatives since 1992 and represents House District 91, which includes portions of Marion and Hendricks County. He was born and raised in Indianapolis and has been a proud Hoosier his entire life. In 1976, he received a bachelor's of science degree from Indiana University. Throughout his tenure as a representative, he has advocated for education reform in Indiana as chair of the House Education Committee, he led a multi-year effort to successfully pass the most comprehensive education reform package in the United States. Bainey believes all parents deserve the right to choose the school that best meets their child's needs. In 2011, Bainey authored legislation creating the School Choice Scholarship Program, providing families who do not have the financial means to pay the cost of tuition at a private school with a scholarship or voucher. Indiana currently has the largest school voucher program in the United States. Representative Bob Bain. Thank you, Ms. Bowling. Thank you to NAACP and to our host tonight. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think that uh, clearly transparency and discussion is a fundamental part of our democracy and it's very critical to uh, a uh, vibrant and uh, successful uh, country that we live in today. Um, as my introduction said, I have um, my almost my entire career in the General Assembly have been very focused on education. And I clearly believe that education is the opportunity to bring everyone together and to uplift everybody, regardless of where you start, regardless of your color, race, religion, creed. Um, I, I frequently uh, spend a lot of time discussing it. In fact, uh, I have spent time uh, most recently talking to, uh, the, my message to a lot of people is uh, a number that I will bring to your attention tonight, which is 30 out of 1,000. Um, 30 out of 1,000 today is the number of African-American kids who pass both sections of iLearn and IPS. If you think about that, that means 970 of our youth could make, could not pass a minimum benchmark proficiency created by Hoosier educators, created um, on standards developed by Hoosier educators and cut scores set by Hoosier educators. Clearly, I think that that is a crisis that we all need to be discussing. Uh, you look at the data, um, if, fortunately, uh, Indian Indianapolis uh, Chamber of Commerce recently did a study uh, looking at equity across the uh, state, at specifically 
uh, Indianapolis, but they were uh, they went out to do this to try to figure out how they could ensure more diversity in leadership positions as they moved uh, to try to have a more inclusive uh, economy. What they found was um, statewide, we have a significant problem. They went to uh, uh, poll data and from the class of 2013, and they looked at um, the African-American population, for instance, as one example. There were 9,125 uh, African-Americans that started um, in ninth grade um, in 2009. By the time they graduated from high school in 2013, 1,990 of them had dropped out of high school, had just disappeared from our system, 22%. Unacceptable my mind. You go down further and drive down further, you find that only 10.57% of African-American kids actually completed any type of degree, post-secondary degree, credential, or certificate six years upon uh, after graduation. To me, that's a crisis. It's a crisis that we all need to get behind and start looking at how do we find resolution. Uh, it's not an easy, it's an easy lift. We know um, the numbers are very similar to poverty, regardless of race, creed. Um, if you are born to a family of poverty, you have uh, definite uh, disadvantages today in our society. And I think as we talk about CRT, we talk about trying to make sure we're culturally inclusive. I think it's imperative that we look at data and make sure we're really focusing on trying to make a difference in these kids' lives. 970 of those kids do not have, I wanna just emphasize that, do not have minimum benchmark proficiencies. Why'd they drop out of high school? I would argue one of the reasons was they weren't ready. The second one, I would argue that high school is probably not relevant to them. I'm uh, glad to be here tonight, happy to answer questions. I know we'll have diversity of opinion and um, hopefully a, a lively discussion, but I thank you very much for the opportunity to come and have a discussion with you this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Bainey. Um, in an effort to try to make sure that we get to as many questions as possible, we're going to ask a couple questions right now. And um, my first question is for um, Representative Bainey. Uh, Representative Bainey, you talked about the disparities that um, occur with respect to um, you know, the racial disparities. You indicated that you, know, you started at, at ninth grade for your discussion. Were you aware that in third grade, there really is um, a very small gap between the races for school children. Have you given any thought to making a difference on that level or looking into what happens between third grade and ninth grade? Because I believe that if third grade that they were both, they're all um, performing about the same, then by ninth grade, if the gap has widened so that it's a little bit too late. What are your thoughts? Um, the data that I shared with you, the 30 of 1,000 is not high school. 30 of 1,000 is the number of student African-American students who pass both sections of iLearn. iLearn is an uh, assessment instrument that's given grades three through eight. Clearly, the problem is earlier. I would, no question in my mind. Uh, I, I would also suggest that one of our biggest stumbling blocks today is reading. Um, we clearly have data that indicates that our kids do not have a mastery of reading at an early age. We also know from the data, if you look at it, that um, poverty as an indicator, kids who come to school in poverty come to school anywhere from 12 to 18 months behind. So I, I'm, you know, and, and Ms. Bowling, when I'm, I did not mean to indicate that all that it is a high school issue. I, what I would argue is a his, the issue starts much earlier, clearly, and then it, it just actually gets worse because we continue to pass these kids on without having the mastery, which is why when they get to high school, the rigor of high school becomes such that, um, you know, you, you have text at a ninth grade level and you're reading at a third to sixth grade level, um, you know, any of us would find that as a challenge. So uh, there are some things we're doing. The Department of Ed is actually taking a very definite focus on the science of reading. Uh, we know that there's a, a huge issue statewide, uh, but clearly the issue I, I would totally agree um, and have advocated, will continue to advocate for more early learning opportunities for trying to meet these kids, providing comprehensive student support, um, looking at how we create a culture of learning so that uh, kids that come to school, they value education. 
Um, I think all of those things um, are things that we have to look at at an early age, not wait till they're high school. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bailey. Um, Senator Taylor, in Indiana, as we've been talking, there are significant gaps in uh, academic achievement of Blacks in our public schools compared to whites. There is no question that over the past 60 years, we have had a number of educational reform movements from new teacher qualifications requirement to high stakes testing and constant testing of school children. Yet despite these efforts, there are still significant racial disparities in academic achievement in the state. Given your concern about school children, how do we eliminate these gaps? <clears throat> well, uh, let, let me start out by saying that's what this discussion of CRT is really about. Uh, to make it and to break it down to its most simple element, there have been many policies in place since the Brown versus Board of Education decision that we had in this country, all the way from colorblind to redistricting where children from the inner city were bused into majority districts and given opportunities to learn in the same physical classrooms as the majority students. That program, if you look at the statistics, has not worked. What critical race theory does is make us look at whether or not those policies, colorblindness, uh, school choice, all of the other things that we tried, what have been, what has the effect been on the communities that they were gu guided to actually promote? And if you look at them, you will see even though the school choice program that my colleague put together in 2011, we are in 2022, the gap has widened. We have to start making a conscious effort to understand that not only did, while we made those decisions to try to, to close those gaps, that we didn't change the system that those gaps were created by. We did nothing to change the curriculum. We did nothing to change the standardized testing that we've been talking about that dictates whether or not a child is successful in the classroom. Yet we did all of these other public policy things to try to close that gap. Critical race theory says you have to account for the race. And if you do that, and then you look back at the system you have to understand that only one of two things could have happened. Either inherently people of color, minorities cannot learn at the same level as their colleagues in the, uh, the majority in the classroom or the system that created the disparity still exists. Now, I don't want people to, if you wanna admit or say the first one is true, that's fine but I tend to believe that the system in which all of these programs uh, that we can put together is broken and we need to take a better look at it. So uh, that's what I believe. And I think that if we take that approach, we'll find the difference in the results. Hey, Gonzalez. And Angeles T. Arredondo, E. Prudipus Ernum. Senior Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, writes on identity politics, critical race theory, critical race and critical theory, multiculturalism, assimilation and nationalism, as well as foreign policy in general. He spent close to 20 years as a journalist, 15 of them reporting from Europe, Asia and Latin America. He left journalism to join the administration of President George W. Bush but he was speechwriter for the chairman of Securities and Exchange Commission before moving to the State Department's European Bureau. Gonzalez is a member of the of President Donald Trump's 1776 Commission. He is a widely experienced writer and public speaker. He has written for National Affairs, the American Interest, Foreign Policy, the Claremont Review of Books, City Journal, Bullet, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, Time.com, The Hill, Forbes.com, USA Today, 
The Guardian, The National Interest, The Daily Signal, National Reviews, and others. Welcome, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williams, and uh, thank uh, the, uh, the University, the American Constitution Society, and the Black Law School Association for inviting me to speak. I can't tell you how much of a high honor it is for me to be invited to speak to the NAACP, an organization whose work I admire, even when I disagree with it, your decades-long defense of human dignity and of the right of all Americans to benefit from equal treatment speaks to the highest values of this country. My criticism of critical race theory, and I am a critic, fits exactly within that centuries-old tradition of demanding that government treat us all equally, regardless of what race we are. There's a common, there's common ground between us, or CRT isn't it. I believe that critical race theory is corrosive of American principles and traditions, and of laws that all Americans, but especially Black Americans, fought for centuries to force the government to create and implement. It's the application of critical uh, of CRT's tenets in our schools, in our offices, in our military, and even in houses of worship that are violative of these laws. It breaches several aspects of the Constitution and the Civil Rights Act, including the First and Fourteenth Amendments, Titles Six and Seven. Therefore, all, elect all elected officials across the land have a responsibility to eradicate such practices, and I'm happy to have worked with officials from different states to have passed anti-CRT legislation. In the case of your state, I know there's a proposal regarding CRT. Uh, if I had advice in the proposal, I would have cautioned against stripping the proposal of anything that would protect uh, uh, parents and children from discrimination. It is for these reasons that I traveled the country. I traveled to 35 cities last year, speaking to parents and legislatures about CRT. Uh, CRT is not about teaching the contribution of Black Americans or immigrants like me to the making of America. I consider it a tragedy personally that children graduate high school without any idea of who Frederick Douglass and Bernardo de, de Gavis were, nor is CRT a, a, about fixing the problems of impoverished Americans, whatever their race or national origin. If that were the case, I would defend CRT, nor is it about solving discrimination. So CRT is self-consciously not just a philosophy or a legal discipline. Uh, CRT is a tool to change society, another instrument to tear down the narrative of American history and culture and replace it with a counter-narrative. Perhaps we should start by answering the question, what is critical race theory? I will use here the definitions given by the architects of critical race theory. None other than Harvard professor Derek Bell, long recognized as the godfather of CRT, would um, put it this way. Quote, as I see it, critical race theory recognizes that revolutionizing a culture begins with a radical assessment of it, unquote. The idea that CRT was to be used to transform American society is central. Uh, this aspect of CRT is underlined by all these creators from Kimberly Crenshaw, the godmother of CRT, if you will, on down, the godmother. Another trait central to TR CRT is the idea that society is oppressive, American society that the rich and powerful have manipulated concepts to create a reality that hides from the rest of us the fact that we're oppressed. All the critical theories, not just CRT, believe that it is the job of their practitioners to open our eyes to our own subjugation and in, in that way to lead us to our liberation. All liberation depends on the consciousness of servitude, wrote the critical theorist Herbert Marcuse. When we do not understand our own oppression, we have quote unquote false consciousness. This false consciousness is to be eradicated to the current so-called anti-racism trainings that our children and employees are currently being subjected to. I say so-called because in my opinion, some of these programs can be quite racist themselves. The practitioners of CRT separate people in classrooms, office, or into racial or sexual categories, and they teach, quote, per that perfectionism, punctuality, urgency, niceness, worship of the written word, progress, objectivity, rigor, individualism, capitalism, and liberalism are some of the characteristics of white supremacy culture and need an elimination, unquote, as the Wall Street Journal reported just last week. They teach the works of Ibram X. Kendi, not an architect, but a popular practitioner of CRT, who believes that we need to have racial discrimination in the present and in the future. I struggle to understand what separates Kendi from the racist Southern governor who stood at the school, schoolhouse door proclaiming that the South would have, the South would have segregation forever. What else is CRT? Well, let's look at the main elements that one of his main architects, Richard Delgado at the University of Alabama, chose to include in his primer on the subject, which is called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. 
the first and most obvious is that racism is systemic in America. Um, uh, in, in not an individual sin or crime, but quote unquote, embedded in the ordinary business of society. One can find racism in normal science, Delgado says, putting that term inside scare quotes. One can find it in quote, the usual way society does business. The fact that racism is systemic is why Derek Bell says CRT must be revolutionary. If the system is systemic, sorry, if, this, if, if the system is, is, is racist, then you have to eliminate the system and replace it. That is just a logical conclusion. Um, the second tenet that of CRT that Delgado discusses is interest convergence. All whites, rich and poor, benefit from racism and thus have no incentive to eradicate it. This is a, an indictment of humanity and human nature. Nobody, nobody that I know wants a racially unfair system. Everyone's chest fills with pride when someone uh, rises from poverty and attains wealth, status, um, stardom uh, because of their own ability. And in America, more than any other place in the world, we see this thing happen every day. Um, it, this seems to be no appealing to better angels on this, under a system that is really grievance filled. Its job is deliberately, deliberately to stoke resentment. Uh, yes, I, there are ugly, many ugly races in America, as there are the world over. I have lived at least a year in seven different countries in more if you count place uh, months at a time. Let me assure you that sadly, racism is everywhere, a universal condition. But the idea that America is uniquely racist or systemically racist uh, simply does not square with the America that I see today. Another tenet of CRT is intersectionality or the idea that we have different le levels of marginalization that can make us a victim of societal oppression several times over. A final element says Delgado, is the idea that because, quote, the different histories and experiences of, with oppression, Black, Indian, Asian, and Latino writers and thinkers may be able to communicate to the white counterparts matters that the whites are unlikely to know, unquote. Then Delgado adds for emphasis, quote, minority status, in other words, brings with it a presumed competence to speak about race and racism, unquote. This mentality quickly devolves into essentialism and numerical proportionalism. Essentialism is the idea that members of a race or group have a number of behavioral attributes that are inherent to their race or group. Whereas numerical proportionalism is the idea that everywhere classrooms, courts, offices must reflect the exact ethnic, racial, and sexual proportion that obtains in the country or at least in a given locality. In the practice, Delgado's presumed competence quickly unraveled into ill will Delgado, for example, took it upon himself to drive white males away from the field of civil rights, going so far as to call those who refuse to leave imperialists. Um, and, but let me assure you, this is not a matter, a matter of numerical participation by race or skin tone. It wasn't. Everything had to do about ideology. When George H.W. Bush appointed Justice Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court, Derek Bell reacted with what can only be described as an epic tantrum. I shouted to repeat what Bell wrote at the time, but here is but a small part of it. Quote, the choice of a black like Clarence Thomas replicates the slave master's practice of elevating to overseer and other positions of quasi power, those slaves willing to mimic the master's view. I ask you in all sincerity, is this really how we want to speak to one another? This, this type of dehumanizing rhetoric is not intended to encourage dialogue. It is intended to shut dialogue. Um, this is why I believe that critical race theory, it's not really about calling all the races to be represented at the table. That's a false facade. What the architects of critical race theory really want is ideological conformity about, uh, around the views of the left. Justice Thomas Winston Sears, who, who endured incredible criticism when she was elected uh, just last uh, year in Virginia, in Thomas Sowell need not apply. It is because Professors Bell, Crenshaw, Delgado, and the rest made it abundantly clear that critical race theory is an instrument to transform society. This brings us to another important point. Today's defenders of critical race theory constantly dismiss the idea that critical race theory is a Marxist construct. They should take it up with the architects, architects of critical race theory. Delgado described the founding conference of critical race theory in 1989 in a convent at Madison, Wisconsin in the following manner. 
quote. So we gathered at that concert, at that convent for two and a half days around a table in an austere room with stained glass windows and crucifixes here and there, an odd place for a bunch of Marxists, quote unquote. And Delgado is by no means, I assure you, the only CRT founder who's quite comfortable affirming his, affirming his own Marxist orientation. Um, let me finish by dismissing another falsehood that today's proponents of critical uh, race theory spread. And that is that is not taught in K through 12 schools or, so, or, or used in so-called anti-racism trainings in the office. Yes, yes, it's true that third graders are now being asked to read 9,000 word papers by Crenshaw or Patricia Williams. Uh, but let me assure you the programs and curricula being implemented in schools are very much guided by the tenets of criti critical race theory. When Evanston, Illinois mother, Nora Boyayi, decries the fact that her son, who was once filled with ambition and wanted to be a teacher, now comes home and says, but mommy, there are those systems put in place that prevent black people from accomplishing anything. Quote. Uh, that is classical critical race theory. It was none other than Derrick Bell who wrote, quote, black people will never gain full equality in this country, unquote. When an advisory board in Virginia's Loudoun County says that district, uh, uh, that, that district demanded that teacher, sorry, when an advisory board in, in Virginia's Loudoun County district demanded that teachers be dismissed if they criticized mm -hmm. equity training inspired by critical race theory, that is critical race theory. Or when a New York City private school teacher is publicly shamed for not supporting a curriculum built around racial identity, that is critical race theory. Racial identity is a building block of critical race theory. There is common ground, much common ground between us. I want black history taught. I want to fix the problems of the poor communities. I and the overwhelming majority of our countrymen want discrimination banished forever. It can be common ground. We both want the same thing, a fair shot of the American dream. But CRT sadly none, does none of those things. It is not intended to. I th thank you for your attention and, and um, I'll take whatever questions come my way. Thank you. Professor Kevin Brown has been on the faculty of Indiana University Maurer School of Law since 1987. The son of two Indianapolis public school teachers and a native of Indianapolis, he attended Indiana public, Indianapolis public schools until the fifth grade and graduated from North Central High in 1974. In 1978, Professor Brown graduated with distinction from the Indiana University Kelly School of Business where he majored in accounting after spending his first year of law school here at McKinley School of Law, Professor Brown transferred to and graduated from Yale Law School in 1982. After graduation, he joined the Indianapolis law firm of Baker Daniels, now Flagrant Drinker, Bindle, and Rao until 1987. He teaches torts, law, and education, transnational inequality, and sports law. Brown has been a visiting professor at four different law schools in the United States and affiliated with law faculties and universities on four different continents. Professor Brown was an original participant in the first critical race theory workshop held in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989, as well as four of the next six annual workshops. As a result of his participation in CRT, in 1991, he developed the first course on race and law in any law school in the state of Indiana. For nearly 35 years, his primary research interests are in the area of race, law, and education, and the global impact of African-American struggle. Brown has published two books and over 80 articles or comments on issues such as critical race theory, school, school desegregation, Affirmative Action, African American Immersion Schools, and School Choice. His chapter entitled The History and Conceptual Elements of Critical Race Theory is the first chapter in the Handbook of Critical Race Theory in Education. A frequent speaker at scholarly conferences, Brown has spoken on issues of race, education, diversity, or global impact of African Americans over 200 times. Welcome. Professor Brown. 
Mr. C. Pull this up. I'm not going to respond to everything that Mike said because it would take all my time. But I do want to say I am not a Marxist. We were not Marxists. We read Marxist writings as we read writings of John Locke, of, of Immanuel Kant, of any great philosopher. But we were not Marxists. We were not trying to tear down American society. We were trying to open up American society so that it was fairer for everyone. Um, I want to thank the NAACP for sponsoring this along with the American Constitutional Society and, and with, with BALSA. Um, I'm going to talk to you and explain critical race theory as someone who was in the room. I was at the original meeting in 1989. I attended five of the first seven critical race theory workshops. Um, there we are in the beginning. Uh, as you can see, there's Derek Bell. There's Richard Delgado. There's Mari Matsuda. There's Kendall Thomas. There's uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, here's Neil Gotanda. Uh, that handsome guy back there, that's me. Had a lot more hair. Um, there was when I was young as a, as a law professor. So, you know, law students do this to you. Uh, um, before I really get started on my remarks, so I want to situate myself because we realize it's important to situate yourself because how race and ethnicity look depend on where you sit in the socioeconomic structure. So, so let me situate myself so that you know uh, where, I'm, where I am at. I'm in Indianapolis, Nate. This is my hometown. Uh, I went to segregated schools in the IPS up through the fifth grade. Graduated from North Central High School in 1974, Kelly School of Business in 1978. I spent my first year of law school. It was over at the Heron building over there. Transferred to Yale, graduated from Yale Law School in 1982. I was the second attorney of color to work at a law firm of any significant size in the entire state of Indiana when I came back in 1982. I was the third faculty member of color uh, to work as a professor at Indiana University Law School down in Maryland. Indeed, as I stand here before you, I am the longest serving law professor of color in the history of the state of Indiana. There is no reason to look for anyone before me. It really starts from me and going forward. Uh, yes, I participated in critical race theory. I developed the first race and law course that was taught in any law school in the history of the state of Indiana. So I think giving you that background, hopefully you understand, I actually may be the best person to talk to an audience like this about what critical race theory actually means. Um, um, before, before I do that, one other thing I wanna, I wanna do, um, keep in mind, we were law professors. We were law professors talking about the law. Now, let's be clear what it is law professors do. Law professors are the people, teach the people in our society who administer justice. Law professors are all about what is just, in our society. And given my background, you see that my background was similar to the other people who were there. Because the other thing about critical race theory was that was the first time you had a group of law professors of color who were at predominantly white law schools coming together to talk about race and law. We were all having experiences of seeing a very different kind of law than what our white colleagues were seeing. But to finish this off, some people think that law, lawyers, judges, somehow commune with God when they come down with legal decisions or have a pipeline to the Almighty. And as a law professor, you know that they don't. But you know, they're your former students. You were teaching them. They are humans. They make mistakes. They have errors like every human does. And let's face it, you don't get more being in the system than being a law professor. Being a law professor means you are defining the system. So yes, we were trying to change the system. Um, now let me start with a definition of critical race theory. Critical race theory is a framework 
that helps us understand how race and racism continue to shape the meaning of racial inequality in our dominant, in our dominant culture, in our concepts of equality laws, and in our institutional governmental, governmental practices and private practices. It's the failure to address it means that our racial disparities continue. Uh, and man, I love this one. I'm gonna go through these disparities, but, but this is really the way, the way I feel. Like the year I was in 2022, I'm going, we went back to 1989 and we said, look, we can tell you what America looks like in 2022. Let's go back in 1989 and see if we can tell you how you can change it. And of course, <laughs> no one seemed to care, uh, which is the way it was with critical race theory, right? No one really seemed to care what we did until the last couple of years. It was really when, when, when Donald Trump signed uh, the executive order, uh, that's when people seemed to care. But to understand critical race theory, to really understand, if you really want to know what it's about, you have to start with the social economic disparity in the important qualifications and conditions of our lives. That's what we were concerned about. We were concerned about the racial disparities in the important statistics. Now, that means I gotta show you the statistics. And I know that a lot of times people look at statistics and they go, oh God, don't give me numbers, statistics or statistics. I understand that. But I'm asking you as I show you these statistics, I am trying to make a point. The point I'm trying to make by showing you these statistics is to make the point that the lives of people of color, especially black people, are far more shaped by our history of racial discrimination than any other group. I'm trying to let you look at those statistics because when you see them, you will understand not only that black people have less money in this society, but it means that we don't have the money for vacations to Europe or to Africa. Uh, that we don't have the money for tutors for our kids. We don't have the money for SAT courses. We don't have the money to pass on to our kids to give them a head start in life. Uh, we're gonna have experiences with our criminal justice system, negative experiences with our criminal justice system. And we're gonna know people who are going to be incarcerated. Um, the other thing before I show you the statistics, we're, we're meeting in 1989. 1980s were a devastating decade for the black community. 275% uh, increase, okay, I'm being told to stay close to the microphone. 275% uh, <laughs> increase in the, in the percentage of black males who were in jail. Uh, we're gonna see that the family income stayed about the same. The Bush administration had just come into office. They were elected with 60% of whites voting for them, but only 11% of blacks. That was an improvement because the Reagan administration had a larger percentage of whites that voted for them and a smaller percentage of blacks. School desegregation, which was one of our major programs to close racial disparities had peaked and we were on the road to resegregation. And then the Supreme Court had delivered opinions that really moved its jurisprudence towards color blindness. The problem with color blindness was that we knew that was going to freeze in place the existing socioeconomic disparities. And I'll make that point in just a second. But for those of you who are law, law students out there, lawyers, 1989 was City of Richmond versus Croson. Hopefully I don't have to tell you any more than that. Um, let's go to the statistics. This is family income for a 60 year period. And think about where we are here. If you sort of see the start of the civil rights era is 1960, today is 2022, we're meeting right in the middle, which means you can tell what we saw in terms of the rates of disparities. And you can look out over the last 30 years. And I think those 30 years proved to you, we were more prophets than fools because we were talking about how those disparities were gonna be frozen into place. But here's another way to look at, at the family income. This is black family income to whites, and you see there's virtually no change. Percentage of blacks over the age of 25 with college degrees. You see, as, as the line goes up, the line goes up for both groups. Here's the ratio. 
The ratio does get a little better between 1990 and 2019. This is really one of those areas of progress that you see. Percent of families in poverty. As the line comes down, it comes down for everyone. Here's the ratio. So, you know, we get to a point where 2020, where there's only three times as many black people in poverty as whites, an improvement over 3.6. Not a significant improvement, but an improvement. There is unemployment. Here's the ratio of unemployment, right? 1.8 as opposed to 2.4, but the 1.8 takes you back to where we were in 1970. Here's home ownership. <laughs> Here's another shot of home ownership. Virtually no change in black home ownership in 50 years. Life expectancy. Here, so we, we, we now only live 5.8 years as, as long. Um, I am hoping that you have seen what I was trying to show, which is that these racial disparities have been with us for 60 years without really much of a quote which means from the beginning of the civil rights era till today, we haven't seen a whole lot of change. So what we were trying to do with critical race theory was go, what is wrong? What went wrong? Why are we not seeing these gaps close? Um, as we come to the end of the, 19, of, the, of the 1970s and into the 1980s, we start to see a change in American thinking about race. From segregation and slavery, the notion about racial thinking was there really is something wrong with black people. That's what justified slavery. That's what justified segregation. Racially conscious thinking motivated by a desire to oppress people of color. But as we move into the 1970s, we now start to see the change, the movement towards the concept of colorblindness. Um, now, colorblindness is an improvement over where we were. And, and, and let, let, me first, let me first explain what it is. Colorblindness is a view that's tied to a particular view of individualism. Uh, it basic, it's not the only view of individualism, but it has become sort of the dominant view of individualism, especially within law. Within colorblindness, the goal of society is to allow you to discover your true hidden self in here. And then to line up your aspects of life out here so they agree with your inner self. In other words, colorblindness privileges individual self-determination. It's about you becoming the kind of person you wanna become. What is the constraint to you becoming who you wanna be? characteristics that you can't choose. If people treat you like a member of a racial group, ethnic group, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, they are constraining your ability to become who you are. So then coming out of this notion of colorblindness is the idea that you transcend considerations of those characteristics that people do not choose to deal with them as individuals. Let me be as clear as I can possibly be. We think colorblindness makes all the sense in the world when we're dealing with each other. I've got my white colleagues at the law school. I treat them as individuals. They treat me as individuals. That's how we get along. There is nothing wrong with colorblindness when we're talking about dealing with individuals. The problem is, when you now use colorblindness to deal with uh, political, educational, economic issues, now you have a different impact. So we saw this turn towards colorblindness because what colorblindness meant was yes, we would have successful black individuals. And we've seen that. Barack Obama, Oprah Winfrey, Kamala Harris, right? Blacks who've risen to the highest levels. But if you transcend considerations of race, how do you deal with racial disparities? You can't, they become frozen in place. And that was the trouble that we saw uh, with colorblindness. So let me, let me take you through our criticisms of colorblindness. And remember, I am saying, of course, when you're dealing with individuals, freedom is individual. 
But when you're moving into political, educational, economic realm, that's a different realm altogether. Oh, I should have shown you this family well. One more stat. Um, so what's wrong with colorblindness? First, it denies the lived experiences of people of color that are shaped by race. So much that what happens to me is because of my race. If you transcend my race, you're just simply ignoring all of my experience. You're not dealing with me anymore. You're dealing with some fictional part of me that you've created. Uh, the second, colorblindness produces a narrow definition of racial discrimination. Racial discrimination simply becomes consciously motivated racial actions. It's only intentional discrimination. And let me put this to the side too. We were not concerned about that form of racism. When we got together in 1989, we didn't see a problem with intentional racist people like the Ku Klux Klan or the neo-Nazis or George Wallace standing in the door at the University of Alabama to bar black people. We felt that kind of racism for the most part had been won. Yes, yes, the laws were in place and they were effective in that regard. It was those racial disparities that we were troubled by. And, and when you have this narrow of a definition of racism, then it means the other forms of racism, uh, unconscious, stereotyping, institutional, cultural, are all overlooked. Those simply don't count as forms of racism when your focus is only on consciously motivated racial action. Uh, and, and then another problem we saw with colorblindness is it makes the color consciousness of people of color appear to be racist. Right, one of the groups that's sponsoring this is the black law students. And you ask yourself, isn't that racist to have a black law student association? They're denying people their individuality. They're getting together because of race. That's a product of interpreting what they're doing through colorblindness, not a product of understanding that they are having a racialized experience because they are people of color. Third, with colorblindness, because what it is, is intentionally motivated conduct to say someone is a racist is to make a moral condemnation of them. And nobody wants to be condemned as being immoral. So people object to being called a racist. Uh, the other thing colorblindness does, and this was huge, it discounts the importance of history. If you are self-determining, what does history have to do with who you are? So it minimizes the impact of history on our society today. And if you minimize the impact of history on our society today, then when you look at those racial disparities, you will conclude they are caused by something that is wrong with those black people or people of color. Um, colorblindness institutionalizes the experiences of the majority as the norm which will provide them with a tremendous advantage. And then you don't take race into account in order to remedy the present effects of past discrimination. To take race into account to remedy the present effects of our history of discrimination simply becomes a new form of discrimination. Therefore, you can't do it. And that's what leads to the freezing in place of the racial disparities. Um, okay, so ultimately then for us at CRT, we were mostly, mostly driven by the reality that what we saw was American society had simply normalized the idea that black people were supposed to have rights. But this, is, and this was not an idea that any of us created. None of us were involved in creating this as a dominant societal idea. This was something that was created by those people in our slavery past, in our segregation past. We don't have any blame for it at all. What we are all collectively engaged in is being constantly socialized with these kind of ideas. Uh, when I teach my race and law class, I always talk about Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson tells this story about how when he is at a bank machine, 
and he hears someone behind him and he turns around and finds out it's not some black males, he feels relieved. Because Jesse Jackson is saying, I too have been infected by this feeling of black inferiority that is in our dominant societal cultural ideas that I have absorbed. We've all absorbed it. We're all fighting this problem. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting these ideas. Um, so our society needs racially conscious, motivated actions that are intended to dismantle institutional policies and practices that reproduce racial disparities. That is a race consciousness, a race consciousness about dismantling disparities, which is fundamentally different than the race consciousness of the slavery and the segregationists who wanted to use their race consciousness to further racial oppression. So we agree on race consciousness, but not that old form of race consciousness. Um, and then of course, we believe that there should be difference then drawn between policies and programs that are intended to attack racial disparities as opposed to those that are intended to perpetuate them. But I come back to this, it's the normalization of racial disparities that really is the main goal that we're fighting against. And see, once you see that, then you see where the CRT concepts come from. Um, interest convergence and racial realism are really kind of, these are the Derrick Bell notions. These are more Derrick Bell. <laughs> we have a long conversation about Derrick Bell, okay. Not everybody was, yeah, CRT was his, his were, were, favored him, but that's a different story for us. The white privilege, the white privilege comes from the stats. Look, it, it's not that we're saying white individuals are privileged, but if you look at the societal stats, you kind of sit there and go, man, you're gonna really have a leg up if you're white as opposed to black. Um, white innocence, that comes from the colorblindness. Why should I have to sacrifice to cure the problems of our society's past? Well, it's not that we're asking you to sacrifice. What we're saying is our society has a problem that we have to cure. It's not that you're sacrificing, it's that we've got another goal in mind. Um, and then other forms of racism just simply don't get picked up. Unconscious racism, stereotype, microaggressions, uh, and institu institutional racism. Um, and then these others I, I have talked about before. Uh, but I will come back and, and note this. You do talk about the history. You have to talk about the history. You don't talk about the history to talk about the history. The purpose of talking about history is to explain the present. There has to be a link between your conversation about the past and your situations today. History is not disconnected from where we are today. History is what produced where we are today. Um, and then finally, let me, let me sort of leave you here with this as the last real point I need to make here. But in a way, it's reaffirming uh, what I've been saying all along. Uh, what CRT really viewed uh, and views as the important is the social economic issues from a color conscious perspective of attempting to dismantle the continuing structures of racial oppression in our society. And this starts with a recognition of the history of racial dis discrimination because that is the cause of the disparities. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end my time. But once again, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk to you. Thank you, Professor Brown. We wanna ask a couple more questions. We wanna get a couple questions in here at this time. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, is he still there? Hello. I can't see him. Mr. Gonzalez, um, CRT was motivated by a belief that the racial disparities that exist in the important socioeconomic statistics of family income, family wealth, poverty rates, home ownership, educational achievement, and life expectancy are disparities that are traced back to the history of discrimination in the US. More importantly, they believe that institutional policies and practices and dominant American cultural ideas about race are continuing to produce these disparities. What do you believe is the cause of the racial disparities? 
look, I believe there are things that can be done uh, policy-wise. I think that our schools are, are, are factories of disparities. Our school system is, is largely failing us. Uh, one solution that I can think of is, is school choice. Obviously, I benefited from myself as a, as a, as a kid. The school, I was, we, we were poor. The school that I was supposed to wasn't great. Uh, my family fought to put me in a better school, and we won. We won back in the 70s. So I went to a much better school. I think that's the chance that everybody should have. I think that we should emphasize family formation, in, having intact families as a, as a key to avoiding poverty, as a key to avoiding criminality, as a key to, to success and the American dream. I just disagree strongly that America is systemically racist and that the disparities comes are the result of this system. And I think that's the, the nub of our disagreement. I listened very attentively to what Kevin Brown had to say, and I liked what he had to say. I, I, I would like to, to have a coffee or a drink or a beer with Kevin Brown. I think, uh, by the way, you got up and you said that you were not a Marxist. And I, I, I believe you because I believe people. Uh, but you should take it up with Richard Delgado. You should say, hey, Richard, I was there in that convent. Uh, you should stop telling people that we're a bunch of Marxists because I'm not a Marxist. Thank you. Um, I know that um, Professor Brown is chumping at the bits to respond, but we're not going to do a di back and forth dialogue. I do have a, a question for Professor Brown, though. Um, what has been the most surprising to you personally about efforts to ban, censor, and abolish the teachings of Americans founding as a nation that has been practiced since 1619, which has enshrined within its founding documents the naturalness and rightness of one group to enslave for their lives and the lives of their progeny, African people captured and brought to this country. Can't hear him. Yes, uh, well, personally about the efforts to censor and abolish the teaching of American founding. Yeah, I, I tell you the thing I'm most surprised about is the willingness to miseducate the kids. I mean, my God, I, I have white students. I, I can't hear you, Professor. Um, Talking to the moon. Can you hear me? Uh, but what I'm, most, what I'm most shocked about is the willingness to miseducate the kids. You know, I even had today, before this starts, white students that show up in my race and law class who know absolutely nothing about racial and ethnic groups. They know nothing about Latinx populations, Black populations, Asian populations, and yet they're going into an American society that's becoming more and more diverse. You're at a point now where less than half of the kids up to the age of 18 are white. That means a majority of the kids under 18 are people of color. If the white kids can't learn to get along with the kids of color, they're going to be the ones excluded. Uh, and, and that's what I guess I'm most shocked about is the willingness to say, I'm going to miseducate my child so that my child will not be able to function in a world where my child will have to function with primarily people of color. Thank you very much. I have one final panelist to introduce. Those of you who are chomping at the bits to put your questions, um, have your questions answered, make sure that you put them in the, I don't think it's called the chat, but whatever it's called, or on the index cards, or however it's being done. Russ Gibber, PhD is Professor Emeritus in the School Psychology Program at Indiana University. He has worked with states and school districts across the country, directed numerous research grants, and published extensively in the area of school violence, school discipline, classroom management, and equity in education. He is a member of the writing team that produced the U.S. Department of Education's report in response to Columbine and other school shootings, and has led and, has, and was the lead author 
of the American Psychological Association's Task Force Report on Zero Tolerance. He served as project director of the Discipline Disparities Research to Practice Collaborative, a national collaboration of educators, researchers, advocates, and policymakers, advancing knowledge and practice to address disciplinary disparities. In most recent Ed Week poll, he was named among the top 200 scholars in the nation influencing education policy. Welcome, Mr. Skibber, Dr. Skibber. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, thank you very much to uh, the Black Law Students Association and uh, to the NAACP and especially to uh, Gary Holland for his tireless effort in pulling this together. He's just done an amazing job in pulling this together. Um, well, you know, I, 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 ha it's, I have one thing to say that I'm gonna say about CRT and that the bills that we're talking about in Indiana, 1134, 167 out of the Senate. Um, the anti-CRT bills that we've seen throughout the country have nothing to do with critical race theory. I wanna say that again, none of those bills have anything to do with critical race theory. You know, I, I, I loved uh, Professor Brown's uh, tying of, of critical race theory uh, in terms of, of the purpose of history is to explain the present. I want to I want to put that up uh, uh, over my bed on one of those things where you where you so what are they called the the sampler. I want a sampler above my bed that says the purpose of history is to explain the present. James Baldwin says pretty much the same thing. We carry history with us. Um, the his, history is not past and gone. Um, history isn't even past. Um, and I, I want to return to that, but, but this, is, this is about whether we can look at our history, whether we can look at the, the good and the bad of our history, or whether those things are going to be shut out away from us. Um, and they have been purposely shut out. Um, you know, and and, and it's all, there's always a surprise. Um, my daughter is at Purdue in uh, biology. And they have something called the HeLa cell line, H, capital H E, capital L A. And she worked with that cell line. It's, it's one of the most important cell lines uh, in, in medical research. And she worked with that cell line for a few years and never heard once in any of her classes, in any of her practica from anyone teaching at Purdue University. She never heard once that those cells came from Henrietta Lacks, a black woman who those cells were taken from without any sort of remuneration for those and no remuneration from her family. Um, that's something we only discovered relatively recently. Um, the father of, of uh, gynecology, J. Marion Sims and from 1813 to 1884, uh, he's, he's widely celebrated as the father of gynecology, someone who rose from being a poor man up to uh, a well, one of the most respected figures in the history of gynecology. What we don't know, and most of us didn't know, is that he achieved most of his discoveries by uh, experimenting on and operating on slaves, on enslaved black women without anesthesia. Uh, and until he completed his discoveries and was able to find uh, things that, am I out of time already? To what? Oh, okay, I thought maybe I wasn't talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't have my glasses on. You have to move that closer. You got to stand right here in front of me with it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, uh, the Tulsa race massacre, I'm, I'm sure that most of you know about that, but we, we've only known about that for what? Three, four years as, as a society. Why? Because there was a purposeful cover up of the Tulsa race massacre. Um, the people who engaged in the Tulsa race massacre were the leaders of the community, uh, were, were, the, were the people who were in charge, were the business leaders uh, who, who organized the Tulsa race massacre. And they weren't, they might be, maybe felt a little guilty about it the next day, but they made sure that the word about the Tulsa race massacre did not get out. And that held until the 1990s in Tulsa. And they still had a hard time getting it out to us here today. Um, these things aren't accidents. I mean, you know, it, it, I, I can understand how Christopher Rufo feels, you know, how, how he wants to prevent us from guilt because there's an awful lot in our history to feel guilty about. But let's, I wanna, I wanna go into where this whole push against critical race theory really came from. Um, I just came from uh, hearings the, probably the final public input on HB 1134, uh, Indiana's own critical race, anti-critical race theory bill. And the bill's sponsors uh, say, you know, they, they had, there were many weeks of listening to their constituents, to parents who were really, really concerned uh, about uh, the fact that they weren't being listened to in schools parents who wanted to be more involved in their children's education, local control. Well, I, I, I don't, let's, let's talk about where the bill really came from. Um, it came from a man named Christopher Rufo. Who was Christopher Rufo? He was a, a freelance journalist who in 2016 started working for various hyper-conservative think tanks. Uh, at first he was working uh, to promote creationism in schools um, in his writings. But in 2019, he discovered critical race theory or what he thought was critical race theory. In other words, in the government, he found trainings that he found to be objectionable, one or two aspects of those. And he called those critical race theory. Those trainings had nothing to do with critical race theory. Um, but he kept writing these articles and they caught the attention of Tucker Carlson on Fox News. And let's see if this works. Um, I wanna show you his first, first couple minutes of his interview. Oh, it's a potential security concern. I want, I want to continue, you guys wanna continue? <laughs> let's try it. <laughs> so tonight we've asked Chris Rufo to walk us through some of what is happening here. You should know the details. Rufo is a research fellow at the Discovery Institute as well as a contributing editor at City Journal, and he joins us now. Chris Rufo, Rufo thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. You know, Tucker, this is something I've been investigating for the last six months, and it's absolutely astonishing how critical race theory has pervaded every institution in the federal government. And what I've discovered is that critical race theory has become, in essence, the default ideology of the federal bureaucracy and is now being weaponized against the American people. I'd like to share three investigations that I've unleashed uh, that show the kind of depth of this critical race theory, occult indoctrination, uh, and the danger and destruction it can wreak. Uh, for, um, for those of you who are interested, you can easily find this. I'm not going to talk, not going to spend time on the three investigations. Okay, but I will try and get out of this. Um, PowerPoint, let's try that. There we go. We're back. Um, so at the end of this interview, uh, Christopher Rufo declared, I am declaring a one-man war against critical race theory in the federal government, and I will not stop my investigations until it is abolished from our public institutions. So he felt pretty, pretty, um, pretty strongly about it. Um, watching Fox News on September 2nd, uh, 2020, a couple months before he left office and a few months before uh, he led the insurrection, Donald Trump saw Christopher Rufo uh, 
within two days, Mark Meadows, who's currently uh, under investigation by the January 6th convention, uh, excuse me, committee, uh, called Christopher Rufo and invited him to help write an executive order banning critical race theory in the government. And on uh, September 22nd of that year, Trump issued executive order 13950. Um, President Biden rescinded that in, in uh, almost immediately after he was elected and, and in office. But the American Legislative Action uh, Council, ALEC, pushed the bill out in a workshop in December 2020. For those of you who aren't aware of ALEC, they are uh, a conservative foundation that is funded by uh, the, the um, uh, Koch Family Foundation and other right-wing funders, um, and typically writes model bills for Republican legislators to push out uh, across the country. Republican legislatures almost immediately began introducing anti-CRT bills almost immediately. I think I said that once already. Uh, there are now 17 bills in Congress. In 2021, there were 30 states in which anti-CRT bills were passed. There was a statute or regulatory avenues based on that enacted in 14 states. So I wanna, uh, it's it, I, I, when I first started out looking at this a couple months ago, I said, "Well, these bills—they're—they're—they're they're, they're based on Trump's executive order, thirteen nine fifty. People say that, um, but in fact, it's word for word across these nineteen states. Uh, on the left hand, we've got executive order thirteen nine fifty. On the right hand, we have the language in House Bill eleven thirty four, uh, and these are the what's called the eight divisive concepts." that if schools teach, they are in violation of the law. They will make um, people feel bad if they are told about racism. Um, so, so 13950 says, uh, we can't teach anything that says anyone is inherently superior or unfair, inferior. That happens at 1134. Can't teach anything that, that says anyone's inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. That happens at 1134 in exactly the same order, the same words in the same order. Should, and I, I, I keep getting the thing that I've got only a few minutes left, so I won't go through each of these. Um, but I appreciate you being up front so I can see the sign anyway. Um, an individual's moral, moral character is, ne is necessarily determined by his, her race or sex. That's the, in 1134, that the individual, we can't teach the individual bears responsibility for actions committed in the past. That's there. Um, the, the probably most important one and most interesting that no one should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress. So all of the eight concepts, the eight prohibitive tenets are drawn precisely from executive 13950. Now this is really sort of blows my mind a little bit because this, these bills, 13, 1134, these um, I'm, I'm sure they're very, very sincere legislators. I, I you know, and, and I, and I'm not, I'm not questioning the sincerity of, of any of the legislators here. I'm not questioning the sincerity of Professor Brown. Um, but it strikes me as odd that you had parents was their main concern in writing this bill. So I guess these parents kind of went back to Trump's executive order in September 2020 and read Christopher Rufo's City Journal articles in July 2020 and kind of percolated on those a couple years and contacted parents in 19 other states and they all at the same time they were so in sync that they came up somehow with the same exact wording of Trump's executive order. I don't know, it makes sense to me. Um, what was Christopher Rufo's goal? He is so interesting. He's, he's um, very transparent uh, and he puts it just all out there. So he says what his goal was in, in putting this out. We have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic. I think he's succeeded in that as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. That's what he intended. He really doesn't like critical race theory. I got on his Twitter and I thought, well, I'll just go through, 
you know, and see what he's been saying for the last couple of months. I ended up just going through two weeks of his tweets. And in two weeks, he called critical race theory, racialist abuse. He said, we should abolish teachers unions, ban racialist indoctrination. The attorney general, secretary of education, national school board association conspired to mobilize the FBI against parents and label school board protests as domestic terrorism. He called it racialized guilt narratives, racial scapegoating, collective guilt, conspiracy theories, state-sanctioned racism against children. We have a duty to protect children from this evil. Public schools are not a free marketplace of ideas. They are a state monopoly with coercive power over children. I personally think cameras in the classroom is a step too far, but he supports the introduction because they shift the dialogue and make what he's saying seem less radical. Uh, it's it's uh, critical race series of Marxist plot to destroy America. That was a retweet from the Heritage Foundation. A Procrustean morality tale, and I don't have time to explain to you what Procrustean means. Race-based neo-Marxism, identity-based psychodrama, and I think there's a few more that I didn't get. That was in a two-week period. He really hates critical race theory. Um, that was phase one. Starting in November, they started phase two. Uh, they had a coalition that called on states to increase transparency and end critical race theory in school. Again, uh, they brought this out in a workshop conducted in, by ALEC uh, in, in December. And lo and behold, 1134 showed up in Indiana and was talked discussed by the Republican le legislators in just, just a few days after the ALEC workshop. Of course, it must be parents. Um, what phase two says is uh, we need to, the, the teachers need to post on a website all their materials, all their curriculum posted before they instruct it. So in Indiana, that meant in the original bill, before August 1st, they had to post all of their materials and all of their instruction for the entire year. So they kind of had to predict which current events there might be during the year because they had to post their websites on, so they had to would, would have had to know what was going to happen in October, November, December, so they could know what. And uh, in uh, phase two, this coalition led by Christopher Rufo uh, encouraged private right of action against schools. So what, what they were doing in phase two, in what we call anti-critical race theory bills 2.0, is to add teeth to their first set of prohibitive tenants. So that, you know, it wasn't enough that we control people, but we had to include surveillance and punishment in that as well. Um, and Christopher Rufo again says, we launched our campaign for curriculum transparency in November. Since then, 19 states have introduced curriculum transparency legislation. It's now a race to see which one will be the first to turn it into law. I hope to God we aren't first. Um, how does this play out? And unfortunately, it really plays out in these bills. And I, I'm, I'm not, I, I didn't want to talk specifically about our bills, but there were three bills um, uh, that were introduced uh, with the goals from parents who'd been reading Christopher Rufo in July 2020. Um, they were a, a state, it should be SB, I'm sorry, SB 167, HB 1134, HB 1040. You might want to ask yourself, why did they need three? Those things would have put in place a monitoring system surveilling all activities and materials. We talked about that, an advisory committee that was primarily outside of school personnel that was pretty much a free agent with independent power. Now, they have really cut back on that, but if you read the, the, the amended bill carefully, they still have pretty much free agency to do whatever they want as soon as it's, it's um, uh, put together. Uh, parents, it's, there's a system of complaints. In the original bill, a parent or student could file a complaint. It could escalate to the DOE and to a civil lawsuit. Uh, and the DOE was, uh, could revoke a license for, I know, two more minutes? One more minute. <laughs> okay. Could revoke a license for any school personnel, teachers, uh, principals, superintendents, school psychologists, counselors, social workers, uh, nurses, Audiologists, attendance officers, for God's sake, could all have their license revoked if they violated the provisions of 1134 for sexually explicit material, and that's defined as material that's harmful to students, 
the library could face criminal prosecution. I'd hate to see this poor old woman there led away in handcuffs, but I don't know. Um, they have future targets. Uh, Rufo has said that uh, last year he declared a one-man war against critical race theory, and now I'm going to wage relentless legal warfare against race theory in America's institutions. Suits have in fact been filed against schools in Springfield, Missouri, Evanston, Illinois, and Albemarle, Carl, Virginia. Uh, there are efforts to end school discipline reform. They hate the Obama guidance. And in fact, if you look at some of the materials from the Heritage Foundation, um, they, they include school discipline reform uh, and a disproportionality in suspension and expulsion as critical race theory. Uh, encouragement and support of whistleblowers. Christopher Rufo writes uh, a number of places that you can submit. So you guys can write this down if you wanna um, report anyone doing critical race theory, uh, just get on any of these things here. Um, there was another state bill that I wanna talk about that also equated Marxist thinking and civil rights activism that used an outside monitoring agent that surveilled activities and materials of its targets for anything. It's a, the wording is a little different, they said, anything that which aims at the encouragement of feelings of hostility between the European and non-European races, that state was South Africa in 1950. The bill was the Suppression of Communism Act, along with the Population Registration Act and the Group Areas Act. It established South Africa's apartheid system. It led to banning anti-apartheid organizations and the arrest of a hun hundreds of advocates. Uh, Nelson Mandela called it one of the three cornerstones of apartheid. You guys have probably seen the first line of this. Um, we probably heard it a lot during the Trump administration. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. But I recently came across the entire quote, and it's pretty interesting. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. For the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. I would urge you, take a look around and remember this moment, hold it in your memory, because if these bills gain traction in this country, this can't happen again. You, your law school would be fined for inviting me and others to talk to you. You would not be able to hear about the true history of race and racism in America. When that day happens, you know, you will know that the enemies of democracy have ended our 250 year experiment in democracy. Thank you. This question is for, we're ready to the question and answer period. We have. Um, several questions already who they have been posited, so we're going to get through as many as we can. This question is directed to Mr. Gonzalez. What do you see as the biggest threat to the experiment of American democracy today? Uh, there are threats. Uh, the, the increasing uh, censorship on the part of, uh, of big tech to any opinion uh, that deviates from the consensus of the owners of big techs, the billionaires. <clears throat> I think that this the, the concerted effort to change the narrative of America, to change even its origin story uh, and replace it with, with a, a, a different narrative. I see that as a, as a big threat. Um, frankly, the, 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 the many things. Cancel culture is a big threat to democracy. Uh, I, I see American democracy as being surrounded by threats. Thank you. Um, Professor Skiba, I want to ask you that same question. You, would you like to, since you touched on it in your presentation. Can't, can't hear. Uh, I totally agree with Mr. Gonzalez when he says that the, the, um, one of the biggest threats is the concentrated effort to change the narrative of history. 
Um, I think he and his uh, colleagues at the Heritage Foundation, uh, the Manhattan Institute, uh, Discovery Institute, they have been, um, it, it's not really changed the narrative, they're seeking to cover up the narrative and end the narrative. So I, I, I would absolutely agree with him that that has got to be the, the biggest um, challenge and, and threat to our, and cancel culture, absolutely, I agree with him. Cancel culture, it's so ironic to me that, that the Heritage Foundation, who is probably the biggest, uh, the biggest progenitor of, of can cancel culture and the biggest uh, uh, organization right now trying to cancel our history would be using a term like cancel culture. So I, I agree with him on, on, on both. Um, and yeah, basically those kind of issues, uh, concentrated effort to change our narrative and cancel culture. Um, that's what's going on with these attempts to put forward uh, anti-critical race theory bills. Uh, uh, given the, uh, the personal nature of these attacks, I really must be given a chance to respond. Okay, why don't we give you one more minute to, 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 to expound? You know, I, look, uh, I, I, we just listened to Professor Skiba described a, the, what, what organizations such as mine do, which is produce model legislation and put it on their website so people can see it and be guided by it. That is what, that's what, one of the things, one of the many things we do. I, there isn't a single instance in which I or the Heritage Foundation have participated in any aspect of canceling anybody. I write constantly that critical race theory should not be banned. I think that everything should be taught, fascism, communism, kids should be able to, to identify poison ivy. And I think I write about critical race theory and I wouldn't want my, the things that I write to be banned. I want the implementation of critical race theory, its tenets, when they're violative of our laws to be, to the, you know, we have elected officials who are in charge of, 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 of maintaining our constitution. We have only one constitution at a time. Uh, equally, I, I, let me assure him, I want a very deep look at our history. Everything must be taught, the tragedy of slavery, the tragedy of Jim Crow, the, the tragedy of segregation, of Plessy versus Ferguson. We do not want anything to go unexplored, but you really need to have primary material and you have to be able to show where in the original documents, in the original sermons, in the original um, speeches, you base something on. So that's the, that's the only thing I wanted to explain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I, I just, it sounds like you're disagreeing with, um, with, with Mr. Rufo um, when he says that he wants to see critical race theory abolished from every institution um, in America is, is I, I don't know, is, is, is that somehow not banning? Uh, no, no, I, I don't, you, you know, to be you honest, he's, he, he's a friend. I, I, I don't think he's ever said he wants to ban the teaching of what Derek Bell wrote. He can wants I go to ban back through my, can I go back through my presentation and, and show you where no, he I, said he was I've going I've read to all those things. He's, he's, he's a friend. I talk to him often. We want to ban the implementation the, the, of, of tenets, the, of, uh, things that violate Title VI, Title VII, the, the 14th Amendment, that's all we're asking for. At least for me, I'm spe I speak only for myself. So who is going to make the, these um, decisions? If someone uh, says that they feel uncomfortable, a child comes home and says, uh, mommy, I've been made to feel uncomfortable by a, a picture that the teacher showed of a lynching. And I, I would hope that would make all of us feel pretty darned uncomfortable. It makes me feel uncomfortable bring, bringing it up. Um, and then the parent uh, goes on the website and files a grievance procedure uh, and is not satisfied until they get up to the Department of Education and um, uh, then they can file a lawsuit. Um, and the teacher all along says, I never taught that. It was, you know, so who do we believe? Do we believe, is, is where, where is the accountability there in that system for truth? I, Since I've know. never advised anybody to write that, that things that make students uncomfortable be banned, 
it is not for me to defend it. It's, uh, you know, I guess at this point, I, I don't, I don't want to um, interrupt you, but again, we're not, we don't want to do a back and forth um, as, um, <laughs> as, as beneficial it, it may be, but we do want to um, get to all of the questions or as many as we can. And this one is directed to our um, state legislators. It says, given that Indiana is a Republican leaning state, Republicans are the champion of home rule. Why is the state dictating through laws what locally elected officials could be determining and controlling? Can you repeat the last part of the question? I heard the first part. And, and, and I was told to advise you to kind of remain at your seat and just turn on your microphone there at the um, table. Okay. <laughs> um, I, can you? Okay, yeah. So the, the ending end part of that was why is the state dictating through laws what locally elected officials could be determining and, con and controlling? Because that's what we do. Um, I don't know uh, if you've seen legislation. We, I, I want to break this down. I didn't want to talk about legislation here. I wanted to talk about critical race theory. But now that we're on that topic, we passed, just, just sit in your chairs and listen to this. In less than six weeks, we passed over 271 pieces of legislation. That's what we do. So to choose two or three to pick out, we could, I could go through a gamut of hundreds of pieces of legislation that don't necessarily line up with how I believe, but that's the nature of legislation. And I, again, this is about critical race theory and what it really means so that people, the purpose was to say, you don't need to be afraid of it. Actually embrace it. And that, that's for Mr. Gonzalez, that's for Mr. And I think Mr. Gonzalez somewhat embraces it. Now his implementation is a lot different than what mine would be, but there's no doubt in my mind that the statistics that Professor Brown put up on the board do exist. And if, if we could all sit here and say, we see those disparities, we see these disparities not changing for the last 50 to 60 years, and we can all say we're okay with keeping the theories that we come up with over those, that same period of time and keep implementing them, then there's something wrong with us. Something's gotta change. And it's gotta be with the implementation of the system. Um, I, 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 I always challenge my colleagues on the floor, um, you know, Marion County, I'll, I'll leave you with this. And this is, uh, I, I know I got on a tangent, but we, we have over 150 legislators in the Indiana General Assembly. We have approximately 13 legislators of color. And we have a thing called the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. And as Professor Brown brought up about the black law students, uh, students I was asked by a colleague uh, why we have the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus. And I said, and he said, we can't have the Indiana White Legislative Caucus. I said, yes, you can. It already exists. There's not one legislator, and I'm, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean it's been done on purpose. That's not what I'm saying. But if you don't consciously look at that, that we have 150 legislators and 137 are not people of color and we say nothing about it and go on like it's normal, then we're gonna continue to go down the path of continuing disparities. And as Professor Brown said, one day the majority may be the minority. And at that point, that's when the rubber meets the road. So I know I went off on a tangent, but I wanted to get that point out that this is about learning and understanding. And I think that my colleagues, while they have the best intentions, uh, just this is not the way to get it done, in my opinion. Professor Brown. Based on your experience with CRT, with hindsight, is there a way you would tweak 
And if you could go back in time, what should CRT focus on now? Um, Um, I think that's an interesting question because the problem we saw was going to materialize. I can't hear Professor Brown. Um, I, I think the problem is what we saw and what we were concerned about materializing materialized. What we were concerned about was the racial disparities would be frozen in place and they were frozen in place. And my God, I mean, just, just think what you guys might be going through in a three-year period. You saw all the protests after the death of George Floyd in 2020. And now what's the aftermath? There was no police reform. Um, there was no great bill that Biden had. And, you know, we could debate Biden's bill, but one of the things about Biden's Build Back Better bill was it would have cut poverty in a third. Um, you didn't see any election reform legislation. And then we may be very well sitting here in June of 23 with the U.S. Supreme Court striking down affirmative action. I mean, you would have seen the massive, the largest protest in the history of the world. And then three years later, the backlash is so strong that you're in a worse position than we were before the protest in 2020. And, and, and we're sitting here going, well, what's wrong? It's still gonna be the structure. The structure that we were worried about in 1989 is still there. You know, I, I look at the law students, hopefully you read City of Richmond versus Croson, where the Supreme Court for the first time applies strict scrutiny to affirmative action programs and strikes down an affirmative action minority set aside program in Richmond, Virginia, which was the capital of the old Confederacy, a, a, a city that was 50% black and less than 1% of its prime construction contracts went to minorities. And that was what the legislatures were trying to do in Richmond. But because they were taking account of race, it was deemed to be discriminatory. It's just like, I, I'm sorry, this is just a bit of here. I, 1992, the Ishaw versus Reno, the Supreme Court struck down a redistricting program in North Carolina. That redistricting program created a majority minority legislative district that then elected the first black person to Congress from North Carolina since 1900. And that was the, the and the redistricting plan, plan that elected that person was the one that was deemed to be racist. I mean, my God, I, it, it's hard for me sometimes to really teach about American law because the, the problem really, to me, it's not so much Christopher Rufo, it's our legal system. And the way we're teaching you as lawyers, we are teaching you as lawyers, ignore race. If you ignore race, how do you deal with racial disparities? You'll see them, you'll see the numbers, and you'll walk away and go, there's nothing we can do about it because if we try to do something about it, we're taking account of race and therefore we're being racist. You have to recognize that there's something wrong with that. You have to recognize on a deep level our legal system is perpetuating the very oppression that we're trying to fight against. And we now have the most conservative Supreme Court that we have had since Earl Warren was Chief Justice. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor Brown. Um, this is our last question. I'm going to ask each person to weigh in on it. I'm going to start with uh, Representative Boehning because um, he hasn't had an opportunity, I don't think, to, um, to, to say much. So we're gonna let him start, but um, please keep your remarks kind of brief because we want this to be your closing statement uh, and kind of focus your thoughts on how do we approach talking about CRT with those who only have seen one side of the viewpoint.
that's the question you want me to respond to? Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I come to the General Assembly. Uh, obviously, I um, am white. Have, um, I came from a middle class household, so I clearly don't don't always, uh, and I have a um, number of black friends, and I frequently tell them I have never walked in your shoes, so I cannot uh, uh, know exactly what you experience. But I also think that, um, and clearly believe that education is something that is uh, an asset to everyone, and it is truly a great equalizer. As as we looked at at language and and you know the debates about um, House Bill 1134, for some of the comments that have been made about the fact that um, some there was some group up above or some some group uh, Alec or whatever was inherently involved in it, it, it honestly has bubbled up from um, moms and dads who have come to a number of my colleagues. Um, I can candidly tell you the author of 1134, uh, contrary to what Mr. Skiba or Dr. Skiba says, I, I guarantee you has never been to an ALEC meeting, never has participated at all, but yet he is one of the most passionate people who believes that parents have a right to have some transparency. And we are not in, in what we are attempting to do. I, I believe if we do not talk about history and do not fairly reflect history, we will repeat the, uh, the troubles we had in history. So there's no, there's no focus. I think it is not the attempt to uh, eliminate the discussion of history. Um, and, and I do, I, you know, I'm very si sensitive to the fact we've been, we've attempted as we, this process, as it moves uh, these things through the process to, to be culturally sensitive to uh, issues. I've worked with uh, Representative Taylor. I've worked with, uh, I, I have advocated, for instance, that um, African-American students, for instance, need to have more teachers of color, clearly. If you don't have a, a, a role model in your household, which is true, unfortunately, in a lot of those households, they don't have a male teacher. I don't have a male in their household anyway. And then to have a, a not have a male or have an African-American educator ever, you know, be one of theirs, how can they have any aspirations as they move forward to, to be like that? And so clearly we've got a, we've got a lot of issues that I think, and struggles that we have in society today. Poverty is, you know, I, I, race is clearly an issue, no question. Um, but poverty is a bigger indicator of a kid's uh, failure or success. The data that I talked about, 30 out of 1,000, um, clearly is focused strictly, that's a number of African-American students. But you can look at the same number, very similar number for kids of poverty. And uh, America, and I think our war on poverty has not been successful over the time. We have got to figure out how we can really embrace education, value the um, value education, um, respect one another, and move forward. Um, you know, I, I appreciate uh, Professor Brown's uh, thoughtfulness. Um, I respect his opinion. Um, I think that uh, we all have to agree to somehow come together and try to figure out um, the disparity, but yelling at each other and telling each other that it's your fault or it's, it's somebody else's fault is not going to work. We have to come together with a solution that brings all of us together in a thoughtful way and not in a way of accusations you're doing. Uh, and to, just to end, when, when Ms. Dr. Skiba talks about Christopher Rufo, I have never uh, met Mr. or even heard of Christopher Rufo, so I, I have no knowledge of that. And the last thing I will say, as parents have brought information to me and to others, you, you, bring, you brought, uh, Mr., uh, Dr. Skiba brought up um, Joseph Goebbels from a Nazi Germany. I will tell you, I have a video that was presented to, um, was actually sent to a school board president and it ended up, uh, was um, used in one of our school districts for kindergarten through first grade. And I would find it very similar to what would have happened in Nazi Germany and what happened in Nazi Germany when they, uh, the Nazi youth attempted, when, Nazi, when Hitler attempted to affect Nazi in, uh, German youth. Where, where you start using A is for activism instead of where most K through one kids would be A is for Apple or C is for corporate vultures. 
if you can't tell me that that is a step beyond what is reasonable and acceptable and why these parents are now coming to us and saying, do something about it, I don't know what is. And I think the only way we're gonna resolve it is by coming together and having discussions like this and trying to figure out ways to make it work, but to point fingers and say, you're wrong and I'm right, or I'm wrong and you're right, is not gonna work. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess, let me go. Senator Taylor, you're next. Yeah, I'll, remind, I'll go and I was asked to remind you to kind of keep it to about a minute. <laughs> well, let me say this, I agree with my colleague. You don't get anywhere by calling people out. I have, uh, always been a person that might disagree with uh, Representative Bainey, but it doesn't mean that we have to be disagreeable. The here, here's the reality for me being a person of color and having been through this General Assembly and been a part of it for, for over 12 years. Um, I have never been in the majority, not in my personal life, not in my life in the Indiana General Assembly. Representative Bainey, and, and he knows that as well as I do. But I have been able, through much uh, uh, what I want to call uh, just stalking him, been able to get him to support legislation that I wanted passed. Now, I, I just want to say that where we differentiate is clearly, I want to have a focused debate and discussion on how we bring that poverty disparity back to congruency. And if you can't see that that's gonna be a detriment, eventually the graphs are gonna start going like this. And I, and I think that's when the discussion may happen. When poverty strickens a community and you know that it's, it strickens of one community more than another one, then inherently you're actually focusing on that community. So to say that we can't use race as a category, but poverty is more of a category, I would say they both work together. And I'll leave you with this, on the whole concept of how we develop our uh, curriculum and parents and parents complaining. In 2011, uh, Representative Baining, I was one of the uh, members of the Indian General Assembly that brought the fact that communities of color and the parents of kids in communities of color were actually complaining about the disparate impact and suspensions for kids of color in K through 12 education. I still have yet to see a bill to address that. And so, I get it, we should be responding to what our constituents want. But first, we have to be diplomatic. First, we have to verify that the information is correct. And then we have to collectively come up with a solution to address the issue. And so I, I'm, I'm open to the discussion. I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to stop seeing little black boys suspended at a seven times more rate than their counterparts, just like you'd like to see white kids not being able to go home and say that they feel guilty about being white. So if we can come to that agreement, we'll be more, I'll be more than happy to work with you and we can get something done for everybody. So, but I, I appreciate you. And if I could just one minute yeah. to respond to that, I think Russ will probably, I mean, I don't know if he will weigh in on it, but I have worked and I truly do understand that. Yeah. I've been very vocal about the fact um, about the suspension expulsion rate. I can even tell you, I've talked about it in caucus. I actually have had a bill. I don't remember the bill number, but um, Russ, do you? Well, I just said we didn't pass any so, legislation. No, we did pass legislation to try to go after this. And I worked with Russ and okay. his colleagues to talk well, about has it. Well, it hasn't worked. Clearly is, well, it's, I don't know if we've given it enough time, but we're also working with school districts across the state to try to look at that because clearly okay. I recognize that we were number one and number two, and I had, I got some grief from it. And I'm still getting some grief from some people in regards I'm so to glad it. that y'all are talking now. No, no, we, Let's continue this conversation when we walk out that door. So, so at this time, uh -uh, at this time, from tell, uh -uh, Senator Taylor, we're going to we're going to have Mr. Gonzalez um, weigh in with his um, half a minute. Now, so they took up all your time with his I, half I'll a minute see, statement. 
I see half of, I have a minute now. I can do it very quickly, actually. I would uh, just uh, tell uh, my opponents in this debate that the idea that American society is oppressive or systemically racist just doesn't make it, any sense to somebody, to the, the country I see today, the country I've been able to compare and contrast with others in the world. The idea that race conscious policies, uh, that the, the government should follow race conscious policies, it's not just unconstitutional, but it doesn't fit in a country that is increasingly multi-ethnic. Uh, the, the, the idea that the, the, the disparities that exist are strictly the result of that system uh, without really thinking of what the root causes of the disparities are, it's not gonna solve the disparities that all of us here want to solve and all of us here understand that can be solved. And finally, to understand that this really is a grassroots effort. I visited 35 cities last year. This is a grassroots effort uh, if you, if people who really want to fight this want to continue doing what they're doing, go right ahead. In San Francisco last night, they just recalled, you know, three school board members. San Francisco, and what is, it wasn't even close. It was like it was like seventy thirty. Finally, let's have goodwill here. To compare the other side to Joseph Goebbels, just just doesn't will not get us anywhere. I but I beyond that, I really want to thank you for inviting me. I have enjoyed it, and I've done this now in a minute and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Professor Brown, Professor Gibbo. Um, oh, yes. I, I really have to say. Can't hear. I don't know if this is there you go. It's on now. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have to recognize Representative Maining. He has been such an ally um, in the legislature. Uh, he helped put culturally responsive um, uh, instruction and behavior management into law. He helped put um, PBIS and other alternatives uh, fighting against zero tolerance um, into law. Um, yeah, as he's, uh, God, I, I, I could never remember any numbers, but um, at the time, they were very important numbers because they really were um, extremely helpful. So I, 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 I really want to thank him for, for his efforts, and I hope we can, can continue to work. And, you know, I, I want to say that I'm in no way um, questioning the sincerity of you or any of your colleagues. I, I don't know anything about where, they, where this bill came from, uh, but it strikes me I, I'm, I'm not so convinced about the sincerity of some of the people at the national level who push this thing. I don't, I don't believe they are sin, sincere um, in this. But I, you know, I think the thing is here, uh, there is no perfect institution. Um, cultural responsiveness, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of trainings in diversity and equity, I don't know about a lot, there's some, that have not been good trainings. I, absolutely, you know, that you, you get a Department of Education who has a law that says they've got to do diversity training for everybody and they don't know what to do about it, so they run out and get the first fly-by-night trainer they can possibly get. And sure, that person might, might make people feel guilty. But I, I think Carol Craig was with us at, at one meeting and, and, and she pointed out for 25 years, she starts out her trainings saying no shame, no blame. And so it can be done right. Um, I'd love to see us bring in national experts on training in cultural responsiveness and make sure that we do it in a way that addresses history, that addresses the need for us to learn from history and does it in a way that, that there is no shame and no blame. Same thing with, with parental, um, uh, with, with parents not feeling there's enough transparency, there are certainly schools that could use more parental involvement. I just listened to Jack Cummings from Indiana University as I was leaving, and he's specialized in, in parent involvement and um, was citing all of the various ways that we could put programs into place that would increase transparency uh, of schools and engage parents more. So I, 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 I said in, in my testimony, and I'd say it again, that if, if, if the folks who are, who are looking for what I think is a real unwise solution in a, in a, um, in a short session, 
uh, that's going to create a lot of unintended consequences. If they want to put that bill aside, there are so many people in the state of Indiana and so many organizations that would just be happy to both work with both of you guys and and um, and and try to fix some of these problems. Professor Brown. Uh, um, I guess I'm the last person here. Um, just get, representative, I, I will actually give you a proposal that I put together. It's a very radical proposal on education, but um, man, I tell you, I'm the son of two teachers um, and, and I'm an Indiana native. I, I'm really, you know, I, the way I really do think of myself is I'm the kid that Indiana said, we're gonna invest in you and bring you back to our state to help our state. And that really for me has always been my obligation. What can I do to help my state? If you, if you don't know my colleagues at the law school, but once you did, you find out, oh yeah, sure. Professor Brown's the only one that really seems to care about the state because the rest of them feel like they live in New York. Um, um, but I am saying because of that experience, our concern is CRT quite frankly, was the Supreme Court. It, it, we never thought about, we never imagined that this was gonna end up as a debate in K through 12 education. We, our, our, our theories were not for K through 12 kids. Our theories were for the people who have the responsibility to administer justice in our society. That's who our intended audience was. And, and I'd say for the most part, I don't think we feel like we've succeeded. I, I think the closest we got to feeling like we, were, we succeeded was Justice O'Connor's opinion in Grutter versus Bollinger. Because if you go back to 2003, there, it was clear that the Supreme Court was prepared to strike affirmative action. And I think enough of us talked about the importance of diversity that she changed her mind. But as I'm sitting here right now, and I'm thinking about, in some sense, I'm thinking about, Indiana legislature doesn't even need to do this. If they wait for the Supreme Court to strike down affirmative action in the summer of 2023, I can tell you diversity, equity, and inclusion training is gonna fold up like a piece of paper. Because diversity, all came from Supreme Court opinions. And when Supreme Court opinions say you can no longer consider it, it's gonna be tremendous pressure on all these diversity programs, wherever they are. Um, and, and in that sense, we at CRT never really got our basic point across, which is to say, if we haven't got it across, the racial disparities that I showed you over a 60 year period are going to continue. Your sons and grandsons and great grandsons and daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters are gonna be talking about the same thing that we're talking about right now. And where our four parents, because they failed to deal with this, left us with the problem we're gonna leave it to the next generations. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we've already thanked the people we need to thank. <laughs> so we don't need to say that again. We don't need to take that time. Um, we apologize for um, going over, except that um, it was riveting. It was necessary and it was important. Huh? Okay, <laughs> no. Um, but I just wanted to say to our law students that that is why you can have the best intentions in the world, but it's not just what you thought the law would be, but it is also looking at what are the effects of the law. And so that's one thing that will be looking, that, that has to be looked at. And then I, I, finally, I wanna say this, is that when we collectively work together, we use the power that we have to change the traje trajectory of this nation. One of the things we can look at is um, a constitutional amendment to change how the um, maps are drawn and by whom. Um, but there are so many things out there that can be done and we need you to stay engaged and, um, and make the changes that we are unable to, to get over the finish line. Thank you again so much.
Have a good evening.